Good evening. On behalf of the staff at the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds in Dusseldorf, welcome and thank you for listening to tonight's broadcast. My name is Lector Finn J.D. John, and I am the Master Librarian at the von Junst Library's Corvallis branch. In yesterday's broadcast, I started telling the story of our namesake, Professor Friedrich Wilhelm von Junst, and the origins of our library. I now continue with that account. In 1839, after returning from yet another round of travels into dark and obscure corners of the world, Professor von Junst was preparing his second book, which we refer to, with a fine sense of black humor and irony, as Das Unaussprachlichen Buch. So far as we know, he never gave it a name. He never had a chance to. You see, Professor von Junst seems to have gotten careless. During the writing of von Unaussprachlichen Kulten, he took special care to surround himself with the protective influence of the twelve colleagues with whom he shared the highs and lows of his inquiries into matters that treaded very much upon the darksome and the loathly. As you no doubt know, it was very important that there be twelve in the circle, for twelve is the number most resistant to the blandishments of dark forces. Perhaps sensing the high level of his protection, those dark forces never so much as tested Professor von Junst's defenses. This appears to have led Professor von Junst into a state of overconfidence, which led him to lock himself away from his twelve friends in the great stone tower while he worked on his new book. In vain did his friends remonstrate against this arrogance, which they felt sure would spell his doom. And they were not wrong. There may have been something else affecting Professor von Junst as well. You see, when he returned from one of his last research expeditions, he was missing his left eye and ear. Moreover, they were missing in a most extraordinary fashion. His skin had closed over the spot where both had been, like the surface of a pond over a thrown stone. It was as if he'd never had an eye nor an ear. He covered for the one deficiency with a rakish eye patch, the other with a broad-brimmed hat pulled low to one side, but his friends, his friends saw, and were a little afraid. He told one of his friends that the eye and the ear had been the price demanded of him when he sought to read the Chol Negral, a tome of towering malevolence scripted by an inhuman race that once inhabited a lost city in northeastern China. This book is, by the way, in the library's collection, but it is not safe to read, for reasons that will be discussed tomorrow. For now, it is time for our daily reading from A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, written in 1912. Let us begin. Chapter 5. I Elude My Watchdog Sola stared into the brute's wicked-looking eyes, muttered a word or two of command, pointed to me, and left the chamber. I could not but wonder what this ferocious-looking monstrosity might do when left alone in such close proximity to such a relatively tender morsel of meat, but my fears were groundless as the beast, after surveying me intently for a moment, crossed the room to the only exit which led to the street and lay down full length across the threshold. This was my first experience with a Martian watchdog, but it was not destined to be my last, for this fellow guarded me carefully during the time I remained a captive among these green men, twice saving my life and never voluntarily being away from me a moment. While Sola was away, I took occasion to examine more minutely the room in which I found myself captive. The mural painting depicted scenes of rare and wonderful beauty. Mountains, rivers, lakes, ocean, meadow, trees, and flowers, winding roadways, sun-kissed gardens, scenes which might have portrayed earthly views but for the different colorings of the vegetation. The work had evidently been wrought by a master hand, so subtle the atmosphere, so perfect the technique, yet nowhere was there a representation of a living animal, whether human or brute, by which I could guess at the likeness of these other and perhaps extinct denizens of Mars. 
While I was allowing my fancy to run riot in wild conjecture on the possible explanation of the strange anomalies which I had so far met with on Mars, Sola returned bearing both food and drink. These she placed on the floor beside me, and seating herself a short ways off, regarded me intently. The food consisted of about a pound of some solid substance of the consistency of cheese, and almost tasteless, while the liquid was apparently milk from some animal. It was not unpleasant to the taste, though slightly acid, and I learned in a short time to prize it highly. It came, as I later discovered, not from an animal, as there is only one mammal on Mars, and that one very rare indeed, but from a large plant which grows practically without water, but seems to distill its plentiful supply of milk from the products of the soil, the moisture of the air, and the rays of the sun. A single plant of this species will give eight or ten quarts of milk per day. After I had eaten, I was greatly invigorated, but feeling the need of rest, I stretched out upon the silks and was soon asleep. I must have slept several hours, as it was dark when I awoke, and I was very cold. I noticed that someone had thrown a fur over me, but it had become partially dislodged, and in the darkness I could not see to replace it. Suddenly a hand reached out and pulled the fur over me, shortly afterwards adding another to my covering. I presumed that my watchful guardian was Sola nor was I wrong. This girl alone, among all the green Martians with whom I came in contact, disclosed characteristics of sympathy, kindliness, and affection. Her ministrations to my bodily wants were unfailing, and her solicitous care saved me from much suffering and many hardships. As I was to learn, the Martian nights are extremely cold, and there is practically no twilight or dawn as the changes in temperature are sudden and most uncomfortable, as are the transitions from brilliant daylight to darkness. The lights are either brilliantly illuminated or very dark, and if neither of the two moons of Mars happens to be in the sky, almost total darkness results, since the lack of atmosphere, or rather the very thin atmosphere, fails to diffuse the starlight to any great extent. On the other hand, if both the moons are in the heavens at night, the surface of the ground is brightly illuminated. Both of Mars' moons are vastly nearer to her than is our moon to Earth, the nearer moon being but 5,000 miles distant, while the further is just a little more than 14,000 miles away, against the nearly one quarter million miles which separate us from our moon. The nearer moon of Mars makes a complete revolution round the planet in a little over seven and a half hours, so that she may be seen hurtling through the sky like some strange meteor two or three times each night revealing all her phases during each transit of the heavens. The further moon revolves around Mars in something over thirty and a quarter hours, and she and her sister satellite makes a nocturnal Martian scene one of splendid and weird grandeur. And it is well that nature has so graciously and abundantly lighted the Martian night, for the green men of Mars, being a nomadic race without high intellectual development, have but crude means for artificial lighting depending principally upon torches, a kind of candle, and a peculiar oil lamp which generates a gas and burns without a wick. This last device produces an intensely brilliant, far-reaching white light, but as the natural oil which it requires can only be obtained by mining in one of several widely separated and remote localities, it is seldom used by these creatures whose only thought is for today, and whose hatred for manual labor has kept them in a semi-barbaric state for countless ages. After Sola had replenished my coverings, I again slept, nor did I awaken till daylight. The other, the other occupants of the room, five in number, were all females, and they were still sleeping, piled high with a motley array of silks and furs. Across the threshold lay stretched the sleepless guardian brute, just as I had seen him on the preceding day. Apparently he had not moved a muscle. His eyes were still fairly glued upon me, and I fell to wondering just what might befall me should I endeavor to escape. I have ever been prone to seek adventure and to investigate an experiment where wiser men would have left well enough alone. It therefore now occurred to me that the surest way of learning the exact attitude of this beast toward me would be to attempt to leave the room. I felt fairly secure in my belief that I could escape him should he pursue me once I was outside the building, for I had begun to take great pride in my ability as a jumper. Furthermore, I could see from the shortness of his legs that the brute himself was no jumper and probably no runner. Slowly and carefully, therefore, I gained my feet, only to see that my watcher did the same, 
Cautiously I advanced toward him, finding that by moving with a shuffling gait I could retain my balance as well as make reasonably rapid progress. As I neared the brute, he backed cautiously away from me, and when I had reached the open, he moved to one side to let me pass. He then fell in behind me and followed about ten paces in my rear as I made my way along the deserted street. Evidently his mission was to protect me only, I thought. But when we reached the edge of the city, he suddenly sprang before me, uttering strange sounds and baring his ugly and ferocious tusks. Thinking to have some amusement at his expense, I rushed toward him, and when almost upon him, sprang into the air, alighting far beyond him and away from the city. He whirled instantly and charged me with the most appalling speed I had ever beheld. I had thought his short legs a bar to swiftness, but had he been coursing with greyhounds, the latter would have appeared as though asleep on a doormat. As I was to learn, this is the fleetest animal on Mars, and owing to its intelligence, loyalty, and ferocity, is used in hunting, in war, and as the protector of the Martian man. I quickly saw that I would have difficulty in escaping the fangs of the beast on a straightaway course, and so I met his charge by doubling in my tracks and leaping over him as he was almost upon me. This maneuver gave me considerable advantage, and I was able to reach the city quite a bit ahead of him, and as he came tearing after me I jumped for a window about thirty feet from the ground in the face of one of the buildings overlooking the valley. Grasping the sill, I pulled myself up to a sitting position without looking into the building and gazed down at the baffled animal beneath me. My exultation was short-lived, however, for scarcely had I gained a secure seat upon the sill than a huge hand grasped me by the neck from behind and dragged me violently into the room. Here I was thrown upon my back and beheld standing over me a colossal ape-like creature, white and hairless except for the enormous shock of bristly hair upon his head. That is all we have time for tonight, listeners. This broadcast is a production of the Friedrich von Junst Library of Forgotten Worlds, with branches in Dusseldorf, Strigoi Kavar, and Corvallis. To learn more about our extratemporal institution of forgotten learning, please turn to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash library. Or if you prefer to visit in person, simply come to Dusseldorf on a clear, moonless night. Rent or purchase a small skiff, and paddle silently north on the Rhine until you see the great stone tower rising from its eastern banks. Thank you once again, listeners. Good night, and as always, I wish you